Imagine it's the 1920s. This student doctor named Han Selya looks at all different patients and notices they have a lot in common. They all look tired. They prefer to lie down rather than stand, and they're not in the mood to go to work. Selya identifies this as stress. Fast forward a decade and a lot of us look tired. We'd prefer to lie down and we're not in the mood to go to work. And the reason for this is still stress. But what's changed is that stress is often referred to as being caused by just one hormone, cortisol, the stress hormone. But the stress hormone doesn't really exist. We're about to dive in to how stress works in your brain and how you can overcome it. But before we do that, inhale, exhale. This video is sponsored in part by Wondrium. Sign up for your free trial at wondrium.com slash braincraft. Quick side note, so stress includes physical stress, which is the impact that disease has on your body, and psychological stress, which is more what we'll cover in this video. If you just want to skip ahead to learn about how to cope with stress, you can use the chapters feature to do that. Now, cortisol is a hormone with a publicity problem. For years, it's been vaguely written about as the stress hormone, whose spike causes a high heart rate and tense or overwhelmed feelings. But this isn't exactly true. So when you hear about stress, in the media, it often gets boiled down to cortisol, and cortisol is described as the stress hormone and the thing that causes stress, which isn't necessarily true. In my attempt to rebrand cortisol, I called Dr. Elizabeth Ingla Shirazi. Liz, for short. Liz is a neuroscientist. I'm uh, an assistant professor at Tulane University. And she also spends a lot of time playing roller derby. It's a really chaotic sport. So if you go to watch a game, there's just a lot happening all over the track all at once, and so it can be very confusing. Which also describes how our bodies respond to stress. There's a lot happening all at once, and it can be confusing. So because it can be confusing, it's often oversimplified and just boiled down to cortisol. But it's constantly flowing through your veins. Cortisol's role is to give you a burst of energy when you need it. It peaks at different times, like when you're waking up in the morning and need to be alert. Cortisol does play a role in how we respond to stress, but alongside other hormones. How does cortisol fit into this whole experience of what's happening in your brain when you're stressed? There's so much more going on because, you know, this is again, such an important response evolutionarily. You know, if we just relied on one hormone to do all that work and mobilize our response appropriately, I think we, if something went wrong with that system, we wouldn't last very long. What also gets engaged hormonally, but what gets forgotten to, to be discussed are the very important uh, and sometimes even redundant effects of adrenaline and noradrenaline, also known as epinephrine and norepinephrine. It's so interesting to consider that adrenaline also plays a role in the stress response in this system because like, cortisol gets such a bad rap. There's all these negative connotations to cortisol spikes, but adrenaline spikes are things that people seek out. People might be adrenaline junkies and going on roller coasters mm -hmm. and things like that. Playing roller derby? <laughs> Playing roller derby. So all of these hormones act in their own special ways to mobilize the body for that flight or fight response, right? The sympathetic nervous system response to a threat. Now you may have heard of that fight or flight response before. It's how our body physically responds to things that we perceive to be stressful or fearful. And it's often, I'd say usually described in terms of threats that our ancestors experienced way back when. So imagine that we see, you know, a saber toothed tiger in the periphery of our vision and we hear a twig snap, right? That's gonna engage the stress response um, just having perceived that stressor. Why do you think it is that when describing a stress response or a fear response, scientists are obsessed with saber-toothed tigers or <laughs> grizzly bears or polar bears or some kind of large predator? Sure, so I mean, well, I like saber-toothed tiger because anybody with a cat knows that you know those animals are vicious. Uh, even a do you have a cat? cat? Do and she uh, <laughs> she we're lucky she's small. Let me just put it that way. We like those examples because they're very primordial, very visceral. 
Um, and whenever we think about a large beast with very sharp teeth and claws, that action activates a stress response in our minds just a little bit. This is how the stress response works in your brain. You can experience or perceive a psychological stressor, like a meeting with your boss or a saber-toothed tiger, and you activate two main pathways that begin in the brain. The SAM axis is a fast response. It's activated by a region in the brainstem. From there, nerves in the sympathetic nervous system activate part of the adrenal gland, which spits out adrenaline and noradrenaline, causing an almost immediate increase in heart rate, blood pressure, and oxygen uptake. Then, meet the HPA axis. It's slower, but the effects last longer. When it's activated, the hypothalamus pumps out a hormone called CRH, which causes the pituitary gland to make a hormone called ACTH. ACTH also acts on the adrenal glands, causing them to release cortisol. In the context of the stress response, cortisol can increase heart rate and sugars in the blood, so your muscles have energy to fight or run. But it's not all bad. Cortisol can actually improve your working memory. This is just a snapshot of these pathways. There's many other brain regions, neurotransmitters, and hormones that are involved in your overall stress response. Now, this is what I think is the most fascinating and important thing about stress. So yes, you have this complicated stress response that happens in your body that engages a lot of brain regions and hormones and neurotransmitters. But stress is something that is perceived. It starts in the brain. And because of that, it's also something that you can almost think away. We've mentioned the word perceived quite a few times. Things that we perceive to be stressful. Just having perceived that stressor. You can experience or perceive a psychological stressor. At a basic level, you have to perceive something as stressful to feel stress. So when we're thinking about psychological stress from a clinical perspective, controlling your response to stress and stressing less has to do with changing the way that you think and reframing your feelings. So so all of the hormones and things that you, you just described, they're still in your system. You're just almost like thinking them away. So a lot of the advice around stress focuses on reducing it, using mindfulness or meditation or relaxation techniques, which are fantastic. If you are doing those and they're working for you, please do not stop doing them. But some research suggests that it might be better for us to embrace these feelings of activation and arousal instead. This technique is called anxiety reappraisal or cognitive reframing, and it focuses on reframing these feelings of stress or anxiety as excitement. Stress or anxiety and excitement actually have a lot in common. They both involve a high intensity reaction, like an increased heart rate, faster breathing, and sweatiness. All of those things that I mentioned are happening in your body before. But we often perceive stress or anxiety as negative and excitement as positive. So reappraisal can help us feel more positive even in situations that are stressful or anxiety inducing. This has also played out in research. So researchers have found that when participants are given a surprise task of doing karaoke or public speaking in front of strangers, Saying, I am excited, compared to saying, I am anxious, actually leads those people to feel more excited and perform better in those situations. So even if all the physical sensations and everything going on in your body remains the same, reframing a task as exciting or positive it can help you feel less stressful and perhaps even perform better in that task as well. Many people have said that the space between where expectation lines up with reality is the space of you know most human misery, right? So I totally agree that the therapeutic interventions really designed to reframe how you are perceiving a situation really do have a calming effect on both uh, you know, your experience of the stress, but also can potentially feed back to the physiology and they can reduce how you physiologically respond either with court level increases uh, or, you know, neurological activation in areas that mediate processing of aversive or threatening stimuli. And personally, I find that there's something really comforting about that. Like it helps you understand the power of your mind because it gives you more control over things that you might think are outside of your control. Like you still have the adrenaline or the cortisol in your body, but instead of 
perceiving them as stress, you're thinking, oh, this is exciting. All right, so think about how situations could be challenging in a positive way for you rather than being stressful. So perhaps a difficult meeting that you have coming up with your boss is an opportunity for you to be challenged and grow professionally and personally rather than being fearful about it. Or a surprise karaoke or public speaking task is an opportunity for fun and excitement rather than stress and anxiety. This, of course, takes some work. You need to be in touch with how you're feeling and it does take time to reframe how you're thinking from negative to positive. But you can always start in any situation by just saying, I am excited or get excited if you're unsure or if you start to feel stressed. And it's helpful to know that stress isn't always bad. In many situations, stress can be a good thing. Anything in moderation is, is generally okay. So a little bit of stress, a little bit of adrenaline uh, helps awaken uh, you know, many things, right? Psychologically and physiologically that you might not have been able to experience or achieve if not for that that challenge in that moment. Where stress and cortisol become bad is when we experience them chronically. The experience of stress involves a bunch of brain regions, neurotransmitters, and hormones, not just cortisol. But remember that you can be in control of this process. Knowing more about how stress works in your brain and body helps you understand how you can reframe it to your advantage. So perhaps you look less tired or you are in the mood to go to work. You are excited. <laughs> more specifically, I'm excited to do more courses and watch more documentaries on Wondrium, an educational and entertaining subscription service who happened to be the sponsor of this video. You might know Wondrium. They used to be called The Great Courses Plus, and it's where you'll find the answer to everything you've ever wondered about through videos, documentaries, how-tos, lectures, and more. If you'd like to learn even more about psychology, they have a great intro course appropriately titled Introduction to Psychology. Whether you're learning for the first time or it's a refresher, it covers memory, development, dreaming, and consciousness. You can probably skip stress. I liked personality because I enjoy spending way too much time thinking about how my personality traits shape my decisions and health and how I experience the world. Wondrium have a constantly evolving library of content and they're offering Braincraft viewers a free trial. Please visit wondrium.com slash braincraft or click the link in the doobly-doo below to start your free trial today. Yeah, I suppose I'm on a mission against simplification of hormones. I just want to help people understand what's happening in their brain and body and currently I'm like cortisol's brand representative. I'm Cortisol's PR ambassador. I'm just trying to make things a bit more positive for Cortisol out in the world. 